Welcome to IFAST University Q&A for this month. It is me. And we had some questions apparently in regard to rehab perspective on weightlifting and powerlifting. And so let's take a look real quick. I get the feeling that whoever asks these questions is actually not on this call. That seems a little inappropriate, doesn't it? Okay. Anyway. Hey, Greg Hawthorne, are you, are you actually on this call? Can you unmute for a second? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually on the call. I'm just bathing the kids. Okay, excellent. Just want to make sure. Okay. All right, go ahead and mute yourself, bro, and then we will we'll get going. So Kyle Moran has asked that during the Olympic lift, specifically the snatch and the, and the jerk, what causes athletes to rotate the bar overhead uh, when it is locked out overhead? Okay. So um, this is actually not a complicated answer. Um, unfortunately, I can't draw the answer. Um, but what you have is an orientation issue in most cases. So a lot of times uh, people will get blamed for like a technical glitch or something along those lines that results in an overhead position that appears to have a bar that is, that is uneven or twisted. So, Essentially, one side of the bar is forward, one side of the bar is back. And it's usually just associated with the orientation of everything below the bar. And so no one is ever, ever symmetrical or, or evenly oriented under the bar. So almost without fail, you will see some, some sort of, of uh, difference from side to side. Um, the, the magnification of that basically is determined on whatever strategy someone is actually using when they've got the bar overhead. So again, not a really complicated question. Um, so, but let's use the, uh, let's use a uh, sort of like the, uh, the jerk aspect of it because you're coming from a split stance position. And so there has to be a differential in regards to the split stance. So if, if I split my legs front to back, um, left leg forward, right leg back, as I'm jerking the bar overhead, the pelvis will be oriented into a right facing position. So your belly button is facing the right as you step forward in that position. So to keep the bar square to the front, whatever that might mean, that means that the anything above the pelvic orientation there has to be an adjustment in the opposite direction. So if the, if the pelvis is oriented to the right, so it's facing the right, that means there has to be an adjustment through the rest of the axial skeleton and the shoulders and so on, all the way up to the bar to keep the bar square to the front. And so the chances are of that happening are probably pretty rare. Um, although you could probably train that into someone, I suppose. But again, there's always going to be adjustments that they're making on the fly in regards to, to weight shifts, instabilities, um, aberrant technique, however I'm getting the, the, the bar overhead. And now if I step from that split stance orientation and I come to a more parallel stance, once again, it's, it's probably slim, uh, slim chances that the pelvis will be oriented forward exactly. So my my stance won't be perfectly symmetrical. My pelvis won't be oriented straight to the front. There, there could be um, any, any form of orientation issue associated with that. And then once again, I'm going to have to make an adjustment overhead. And typically people are going to probably use similar technique over time. So anybody that's, that's ever trained the Olympic lifts knows that, that it's about repetition and, and trying to narrow the, the variability of your technique <clears throat> to where you can be consistent. So it's just like anything else, whether you're throwing a baseball, swinging a golf club, or performing the Olympic lifts, you want some element of, of consistency in, in your performance. And so chances are the strategies that are utilized will, will fall into some element of consistency over time. And so you'll see the same thing showing up over time. It doesn't make it wrong, doesn't make it, make it bad technique. It's, it's usually just a what is. And, and that's usually just associated with the orientation issues. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that? So I've, I've answered that so succinctly that, that there's absolutely no possibility of questions, right? 
Nobody's smiling or laughing. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. Okay. Bill, would this be something you see similar with uh, bilateral squat? I know with a lot of my clients. So, sorry, you, of... you cut out just a little bit, bro. Try again. Sorry. Um, would it be very similar with um, bilateral squat? Um, sure. So I see a lot of my clients, that they actually rotate into the left when they squat, especially at the bottom of the squat, come back mm -hmm. to the top of the square, and they just have this consistent rotation. Yeah, you, you'll see you'll see any number of, you'll see any number of strategies, and again, the, those are all associated with with orientation, muscle activity, right? So so it's it's just like anything in the in the um, the sagittal plane that you would see. So any adjustments in the sagittal plane that someone would make during a squat, there's always a weight shift at some point in time. Nobody's ever perfect. So there's going to be weight shift between the forefoot and the rear foot. And so I have to make adjustments at the knee. I have to make adjustments at the pelvis. And I have to make adjustments through the actual skeleton all the way up to the bar. And so, of course, I'm going to have them um, in, in, in three dimensions, right? And so, again, you'll see consistency of patterns. So humans tend to behave similarly because our anatomy is somewhat similar. We all have internal forces that we have to manage in position. And then we have external forces that are associated with the, the activity in question and then the load. So if I put a bar on somebody's back or I put somebody in a front squat, they don't look the same. Right. So I have to make an adjustment to the position of the load. And so whatever strategy I have available to me based on the constraints that I may have. So I have limb length, I have torso length, I have torso width, I have torso shape, I have breathing strategy, I have eye, you know, my gaze will, will affect any number of things. And so again, there are very common things that, are, that will be associated with using the same exercise over and over again. So it's not a surprise that you see something very, very similar because we all have the same forces that we have to deal with internally and externally. Okay. Is that something you try and train out of people? Like, I know Mike had a, a piece this week about um, single arm squats. So single arm squat? Yeah. So like a front loaded, side loaded squat. Oh, so, I got you. Okay. Uh -huh. Would that be something you try to focus on to get more balance? Well, I don't know. It's like, how big a problem is it? Yeah. I think you, I think that that's when you become a coach at some point in time and you say, you know what, that's within my comfort range. And that's not within my comfort range, right? So you always have, there's two ratings that you always pay attention to in the gym, the rating of perceived exertion. So that's how hard the client perceives themselves to be working. And then you have a rating technique as a coach, and then you get to decide, okay, was that good enough? Knowing full well that there's always going to be these subtle changes. Now, if you see these like huge changes that maybe are outside of where you feel is your safe an appropriate range, then you do need to make an adjustment. So the question is, is there circumstances that I can that I can provide where that doesn't happen? So is it a load based? So have I increased the external force to such a degree that my movement strategy has to change to adapt to that? Right? So or is this something that always shows up? And so maybe it's just a movement based strategy uh, that that shows up. So again, you can have any number of things. So if you'd say, um, if I had a right shift in a squat, then, okay, there's a pretty good reason for why that might happen. So if I have a pelvis that that I can't control the orientation in regards to internal forces, right? And maybe I just do a body weight squat and it shows up there and maybe it gets magnified to some degree when I put an extra load. So by magnifying those forces, I magnify the the use of the strategy and therefore it, it seems more, more um, obvious. And so in that case, maybe you do drive that strategy. If it's just a load based strategy, then I make a simple adjustment in load. So again, you, you sort of have to decide where, where those barriers are. What are you willing to accept under what circumstances? You know, if you're set, if you're setting a world record in the deadlift, you know, what are you willing to accept? Right. If I'm training in the gym and I've got a general fitness, fitness client, I think my standards are just a little bit different, you know. And so those are extremes, but everybody's going to fall somewhere within those extremes. And so I think you have to decide. Uh, you have a model in your head, right, that you say that's a really good squat or that's not a really good squat. Or you give somebody the benefit of the doubt. You say, you know what, this is going to improve. Let's just keep working on that. 
I think a lot of times we, we tend to overcoach and not let people figure some things out because that's how they learn. And again, we just have to make sure that they're within what we perceive as, as that safety range. Does that help you at all, sir? It certainly does. Okay, excellent. Anything else in regards to the overhead position in the Olympic lifts or any other activity, if you would like, we, we can go anywhere we want with these calls. We're not restricted to the, to the questions. They're just to keep the conversation going. Can so we, far so good. Go can ahead. We talk a little more about like internal and external forces. Um, sure. Also my question would be someone who's had like a history of like powerlifting, weightlifting, mm -hmm. they require more external forces to alter their internal forces just because their tissues have adapted to some type of external load, like over time. So, so ask the question again, so I understand you, please. So I'm thinking in terms of like variability stuff and like altering internal forces, would okay. a, say like a powerlifter versus someone who's never lifted before require more external force to alter internal forces just because their tissues are have adapted? To oh, I see what you're saying. Time. I see what you're saying. So, so. So let me answer your question by beginning with a question. Um, do power lifters have to restrict their movement to successfully execute a near maximum squat bench press or deadlift or even a maximum squat bench or deadlift? Probably, yeah. Would it, would it behoove them to create strategies that, that can relatively restrict those motions under any circumstances? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so right away we have a, an issue. So, so an, a power lifter that twists under a heavy squat um, either is going to fail that lift in regards to what is the standard of performance in competition or because of the, the potential uh, stresses associated with load, they might be more susceptible to injury, right? Or they may not be able to be training the appropriate uh, movement strategy that they want to train to get better as a power lifter. So, so yeah, right away, uh, it depends on how good you are when you think about it, right? So the better the power lifter, the less movement capabilities they have. Mm -hmm. right? If you ever had an opportunity to work with some of the really, really high level guys that, that you know, they get into the seven, 800 pound squats, uh, they don't move very well, but they can, they can perform their activity Right? but they're going to intentionally restrict their movement. And this goes with any athlete that may have some element of requirement to restrict their variability to perform their, their, their sport. So a hundred meter sprinter really doesn't want to have a tremendous amount of rotation. They don't want a lot of um, d demands on their frontal plane to control that because they want to run really fast in a straight line straight ahead. So their body should be oriented as such. So I don't expect to see normal hip motion. I don't expect to see normal axial skeletal rotation in those people. And I wouldn't expect to see that in a, in a really, really good power lifter either, because again, from the standards of performance and from the execution of the activities, I need to restrict motion as much as possible. So, so it's the reason that over time you're gonna have tissues that adapt, you're gonna have strategies that you would use, and you'll probably carry over to everyday life because those strategies will, be, will have to be strengthened on a regular basis. Because if I have to relearn how to use those strategies in, 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 the, in the gym, it's gonna just take me longer to become better at what I do. Mm -hmm. So Bill, within that, uh, how important would it be restoring movement variability with an athlete? So, uh, so, so, give me a, so, so here, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second, Sean. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to give me a very specific example because that's a really, really broad question that, that yep. we won't be able to, to, to make useful. Okay, so give me something specific and then we can, we can use that to lead us somewhere else, okay? Okay, so one of my lifters um, squats over 300 kilos, deadlifts over 350 kilos, consistently suffers from elbow pain with squats, has very limited external rotation and flexion overhead. Um, on the table, not too bad uh, with ABA deduction, but we still have this consistent hip pain and elbow issues. So restoring some, some frontal plane or transverse movement with him, is that we, we've tried different modalities with him with very little success. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but th is he still lifting? He's still lifting, correct. So, we so, so now you have a massive conflict because you got a really strong dude there, right? So he's lifting some serious, serious loads, which means, especially the bilateral symmetrical activities, they are specifically designed to reshape the body to limit your ability to turn. Yep. Because if they turn under those loads, they're either unsuccessful with the lift, or like I said, that maybe you predispose them to injury and they're not always going to get hurt. But I don't want a guy to turn under a heavy squat. I don't want a guy to turn under a heavy deadlift. They're going to try to be as symmetrically driven as possible. They're gonna to try to create as much concentric orientation of the body as possible. If you are concentrically oriented, if you have muscles that are concentrically oriented, you cannot move right? They have to create tremendous, tremendous amounts of compression at the hip and at the shoulder. That compression will steal both internal and external range of motion. It is inevitable if you get strong enough, because that's the strategy I have to use to be strong. Yep. So, so, so either be amazingly strong and give up movement, or you sacrifice the strength to try to recapture movement. You don't really, I mean, it, there are exceptions to every rule, right? But in general, the rules are the norms. Right? So, that, so the people to get stronger and stronger and stronger, they will eventually have to give up the ability to turn. On some circumstances, that's a really good thing, right? And other circumstances, not such a good thing. So if we use a comparison in American football, I don't want an offensive lineman to be able to get turned easily. So it would behoove me to make him really, really strong so he doesn't turn easily. Whereas I need a wide receiver to be able to turn and adjust their, their head and their shoulders and their arms and their legs and their hips to, to change body position, to reorient themselves in any number of ways. So the demands are different. So the amount of strength that I'm going to drive in these, in these two different types of athletes is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So when you have somebody that is experiencing this discomfort associated with movement, training, or sports, and they are superhuman strong, you have to consider the fact that they have given up so much uh, motion to allow them to do the heavy stuff. That is, that is the stronger of the stimuli and therefore the adaptation will favor that. So you got a guy that's basically given up the ability to turn things. And so now he has to load structure. Okay. He doesn't have the compensatory strategies. He doesn't have the adaptive strategies anymore to protect him, right? So it's just direct load on, on structure. Yeah. So now he has pressure, he has tension. Right. And so that's what he's absorbing. That's why you get that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. So I don't know what you have to give up to, to achieve the goal that you want. And again, how much you sacrifice. Say, say again. So how much you're willing to sacrifice really in movement. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's going to be the case because again, you just have opposing strategies. The stronger, the stronger I become, especially in the bilateral symmetrical lifts, I, I will eventually start to give up motion. And like I said, there are exceptions to the rule because everybody's going to, somebody's going to hear this and they're going to say, oh, but so-and-so can do this. And it's like, okay, but can they do everything? Or maybe they're the guy that, that, that genetically is predisposed to being great at being incredibly strong and mobile at the same time. I don't know. We'd have to look, look at them under those circumstances. Good question. I think that was kind of like uh, uh, one of the questions that we got. Let me look here. Um, yeah, what, what interventions for powerlifting or long-term progressions? Um, and I think they're talking in regards to restoring some variability. And, and so when you talk about that, again, to, to recapture variability in somebody that you've trained not to turn, and to produce high internal forces and lots of concentric activity, you have to go the opposing direction. I have to restore the ability to, to turn a body. So, so bodies that are, that are high internal pressure based. So think of the, a big super heavyweight 
powerlifter or or strongman as the extreme. Right? They're very concentrically oriented. They're very compressed to create high levels of internal pressure because if I'm too loose under a weight, there's no way I'm going to be able to press it overhead. There's no way I'm going to be able to lift it off the floor and there's no way I'll be able to squat it. And so basically the strategy is actually quite simple. You have to create expansion where they cannot expand. So most people get compressed anteriorly and posteriorly. And that's why you lose rotations. And so with a power lifter or any lifter for that matter, that is, is losing the ability to turn, you have to restore expansion. And so the way you do that is by altering the pressures inside the body. So that's done by position. Right. There's any number of positions that we can use, but just like um, the way the example I always use, if you had a dent in the fender of your car, you can't bang on the outside of the fender to make the, the dent pop back out. You got to pop it out from the inside. And so that's why we use respiration, breathing, because it's the one few ways that we can move, push the dents out from the inside. And so now it's a matter of just reorienting your body such that you get expansion where you need expansion. And so again, most people come, become compressed from the front and from the back. So that's why your bodybuilders look really, really wide through the shoulders because you smush their, their rib cages on the front, you smush them on the back. And so they square out to the two sides and then that's how they get really, really wide, right? But not ideal for athletes that need to turn, change direction, lower their center of gravity effectively, right? But uh, there might be some circumstances where that does enhance things, at least temporarily. So as we gain strength, we've seen people that improve their performance, but maybe that's just a pressure related phenomenon. Maybe that's just overcoming gravity phenomenon, right? Maybe that's just a force output. And then as we gain more and more force capabilities, now we start to restrict range of motion. And so again, that's just a matter of tracking athletes over time and identifying what are their needs, and then making sure that our programming does not destroy them in regards to their ability to perform. So again, if I need somebody with really good hip rotation and I'm driving maximum effort loads or, or very, very heavy loads, and I start to see them lose that hip rotation, then chances are I might need to consider an alteration in my programming or an input that may help sustain the ability to maintain the, the ability to eccentrically orient muscles that allow movement and create expansion inside the a thorax that would typically be compressed under higher strength loads. So Bill, if you don't mind, uh, the, the specific example you used with the bodybuilder who's mm -hmm. compressed the ribs in a strategy so that they're getting like wider resting posture would that yeah. be an example of someone whose thorax is only capable of doing like the bucket handle as opposed to the pump handle expansion as part of their breathing strategy so okay so so you can you can you can mess with both okay um but let me make make it really really easy to see so if if you have um so you know how the, the lats have horizontal fibers up, up in, in the, the, the more superior fibers are more horizontally oriented? Yeah. So if, so if those contract on the back side, they're going to push the, the back side of the rib cage forward, correct? Mm. Okay, now take your pecs and then look at the horizontally oriented fibers there. And so now I have horizontal fibers on both sides of, a, of the axial skeleton. And if if I drive those hard enough with training and load and hypertrophy, I can actually increase the amount of pressure that I can apply to the axial skeleton. That allows me to lift heavier weights and it promotes that hypertrophy that everybody chases in regards to aesthetics, but it also creates that compression. And so that compression is going to restrict the expansion of the rib cage as I breathe in, right? So, wherever that compression takes place will become restricted, whether you're talking about, you know, the, we, we try to separate out bucket handle and pump handle and it, it happens pretty much at every level of the upper thorax. It's just that you don't see the pump handle nearly as much. You can see the, I'm sorry, you, you, you can see the pump handle, you can't see the bucket handle as much. I can't remember if I, if I misspoke there or not, but 
But anyway, it's that just understand that the expansion is going to be limited. Okay. Yeah, you're just compressing the bejesus out of that stuff. And like yeah. I said, from, a, from an aesthetic standpoint, that's what people are chasing, thinking that that's a good thing. And like I said, and under some circumstances, absolutely, it's a great thing. You want to lift more weight in a bench press? By God, you better be doing that. Yeah. Right? You want big chest? You want a big, big wide back like a yield sign? Then, then you better be doing that kind of stuff. But understand what you're sacrificing in the process, depending on the extent to which you do that. Okay. And then you, then you, especially with athletes, you have to be very, very careful with that because athletes like to lift weights sometimes, and then sometimes it gets in the way. You know, people always ask the question, "How strong is too strong?" Well, it depends. Am I still raising performance, or am I starting to interrupt it by stealing something that might be useful? Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Anything else in that regard? Hey, Bill, in that scenario, um, is there a difference in your mind between strength and hypertrophy in terms of compression? Well, so, so <clears throat> to get big muscles, you better get pretty strong. And that doesn't mean you have to be, you know, as strong as some of the power lifters, but that's a, that's, that's a, that's a byproduct of, of the, the selection of loads. So, so a power lifter would, would lift a higher percentage of their one RM. So, so their force capabilities would tend to increase, but in both scenarios, you're looking at, at a greater ability to concentrically orient musculature to overcome load. And therefore both are restrictive. So I don't know if like one's worse than the other because both of them are, are a result of concentric orientation capabilities. Right. So, and, and, and show me, show me a very, very large, you know, super strong power lifter that isn't incredibly hypertrophy. I mean, some guys, they just hide it because they, they don't, they're not concerned about the aesthetics or the body composition. And so it gets hidden a little bit. They just like really big guys, but they're carrying a ton of hypertrophy. So I don't know if there's that much difference. Yeah, I guess it always is N equals one, but I was thinking more of just your general pop kind of person, like depending on what they're chasing, mm -hmm. you know, everyone wants to get stronger. Right. Um, yeah. Well, but, but I mean, again, so, so what your you just your activity selection can have a lot to do with it too. So if you're, if you're doing a lot of bi, bilateral symmetrical lifts, what are you training the body to do? You're training the body not to turn. Well, how do you stop something from turning? Well, you smush it. You take away it's 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 uh, you make it from this to that. That is easier to create internal pressure to lift heavy things, right? So I always get compressed and I always get wider. Just depends on how much of that I do from a volume standpoint, from a load standpoint, and then you know your hypertrophy tends to um, reflect that, depending on nutrition, etc. Goals, who knows what else you're going to be be choosing, right? How are we doing? What, uh, what's kind of interesting about like not talking about turning, like the barbell's designed to not turn. Right. Like I, like I had a client I was doing like kettlebell squats with and she was all over the place and I gave her a bar in a zercher position and she like, yeah, was completely stable. And I was like, right. It's just right. like a guy walking across the tightrope with the long pole. That's right. the, like the exact same thing. Right. And then, and again, you get to be a good therapist or a good coach and you get to decide, okay, when is this appropriate? When is this not appropriate? Um, am I getting the adaptations that are in, in my mind beneficial? And, and uh, do I have some, you know, performance indicator that is that is telling me that I'm either on track or off track. And so you made an adjustment. If, if, if that was the desired effect is to create that, that representation of a more stable structure, then switching to the zercher is a really good idea. But if I want to challenge her to control it herself, then I, I move from the zercher position to the kettlebell. Now, so you see, you get to make that choice, right? And, and again, that's, that's when you, you become the good coach or the good therapist. Because it's not, it's not a matter of right or wrong. It's the circumstances. That's really good. I'm glad you brought that up. Anything else in this regard, fellas? So then is it worth it to chase like expansion-based strategies in someone who's training like heavy bilateral symmetrical lifts if 
the stronger stimulus is going to be the one that gets the adaptation? Well, so there's going to become a threshold at some point in time um, where you may get a negatively desired, like, like, like a negative adaptation, so an undesired adaptation. And so maybe you can, you can put that off by making sure that you recoup some of the, the expansion capabilities or the, eccentric, the ability to eccentrically orient and so, unfortunately, a lot of times we tend to see people that, that have pain and, and that's the indicator, unfortunately, right? And so hopefully we don't have to take them there, but um, if you've got somebody that can move towards the desired strategy for the output from a strength standpoint and then easily recoup enough variability in their system that they don't have pain, then maybe you are offsetting it. But again, there are there are secondary consequences to everything that we that we do or choose to do, and a lot of them are not visible. So you might see you might have bony changes underneath all this stuff that you have no idea this changing, and then eventually you've again created an undesired adaptation that will ultimately become a limiter. And so again. We have to be aware of that. And then we have to make decisions as adults as to how far we're willing to take things, right? But again, maybe, maybe you're limiting somebody's ability to get strong over a longer period of time, but maybe you keep them a little bit more uh, healthy from an orthopedic standpoint. So with that kind of client, how much would you use the acute to chronic workload ratio as maybe like a way to buffer like the negative adaptations, i.e. like some kind of like pain or like orthopedic, uh, like, like a limitation from like arising, if you just like blow them out with like what they're not able to like adapt to. And I guess what would be like a positive adaptation, i.e. improved performance or like. So, so which type of client are we talking about, Colin, if you don't mind? I guess that would be like the bilateral power lifter client since we're already on that theme. Yeah, or um, I, don't, I, don't really pay based. I don't really pay attention to that ratio at all. Um, because one, you're not going to make giant leaps in training anyway, uh, in, in either direction. So I don't really worry about the ratio. I think, I think that, that the programming tends to take care of it. If you're tracking things over a long period of time, it's, it's sort of a naturally, um, uh, programmed behavior rather than saying, oh, his volume was this, and we got to keep him under whatever imaginary percentage that that would represent. You know, you're not going to make, I mean, if you got a really high level power lifter and, and you increase volumes, like total load volume, whatever, again, how are you calculating that by some nth percent, um, chances are you're not going to do that anyway. That would be risky. And we've known that for a long time. We don't really need like a, a calculator of any kind to tell us those things. Okay. Um, it, you could just use you could use RPE and then track load over time in the primary lifts, and you've probably got plenty of information staring you in the face to make those decisions as to how hard you're going to push somebody safely. And again, you have to track it over time anyway because any acute measure I don't I don't know of any real useful singular acute measure that will give you any useful information to pr provide any element of, of programming change over time. It would be like taking, um, like training someone for a really long period of time and then taking one measure of heart rate vari variability and then saying, oh, we need to do this. Not right. knowing anything about how they typically respond via, via that measure. So, so again, I don't think I would, I don't think I'd worry too much about that. Like I said, I think we automatically do a lot of that stuff um, in regards to our program, we don't make these giant leaps either way. So, hope I didn't disappoint you. No, the, no, that's all right. With the question, yeah. And I don't, I don't care if you use that stuff. I, mean, I don't care. Yeah. But I would, I would always encourage you to track things over a long period of time before you try to make any any leaps in in decision making. I usually just track training tonnage for those people, anyways. Yeah. And I check them with them with like a like a questionnaire. It's simpler. So. Yeah, it, it, I I think so too. So I I, I think we're we're probably on the on the same uh, same path in in that regard. Yeah, it just it just is simpler, isn't it?
Right. Yeah. We all can't be Eric Otter, so. <laughs> well, we could, but but uh, you know, our hair would turn gray way too soon. <laughs> I'm just that's just a jab at him. Got him. Uh, yeah, he's a good dude. Love him to death. Uh, anything else in this regard so far? Because we do have some other stuff that we can get to. Okay, I will see if I can pull up another question. Um, can you describe the Juve toothpaste analogy as it relates to pressure management? Hey, this kind of fits right into the uh, to the uh, whole discussion that we just had in regards to shape. Okay, so um, typically a thorax is, has some some element of cylindrical appearance to it, right? And so if I take my toothpaste tube, right? And sorry, I don't have a lot of toothpaste in this because I am a good brusher. All right, so if I have a relative cylinder, right? And so let's just say that you're looking at someone in a sagittal view. So their nose is going this way, the back of their head is this way. So this is the chest. This is the back. So we're looking at the, at the thorax. So when I look at the muscles that envelop and surround and, and are layered upon the thorax, there's really not a whole lot of anything that squeezes in on the sides, right? I got the tubes underneath. So I have the cylindrical elements that are more respiratory oriented. And then I have the superficial stuff that tends to be on one side of the body. So pecs don't wrap around the thorax. They're on one side of the thorax. Lats tend to not wrap around the thorax. They're on one side of the thorax. The trapezius tend to be on one side of the thorax, okay? And so what they're going to do is they're going to provide an element of, of compression on the anterior and posterior side of, of that thorax. And so if I have a thorax that looks nice and round like that, it tends to turn really, really well. But if I want to get big and strong, I have to I have to create a compressive strategy. And so what I'll do is I create concentric orientation on the front side and the back side of my body. And then I squeeze, I'm going to get this really close so you can see, and I squeeze like that. And so now I got a tube that is now wider than it used to be. So there's my, my nice V taper compressed thorax, but they also get narrower front to back. And so this, Colin, we go back to your, your question. I think it was your question was the, was the pump handle. So now I can't pump handle. Now I can't expand the upper rib cage um, in general, but I look really, really wide and I got big pecs and big lats and, and big trapezius and, and wide shoulders, right? But that stuff has to go somewhere, right? So it tends to go, I tend to push more pressure downward, right? And so now I have to have a place that can receive that pressure. So if I can't inhale and expand my rib cage, then the diaphragm has to descend, push the guts down, and then the guts have to go somewhere. So they either go into the pelvis or they go forward because there's a spine in the back, thoracolumbar fascia, which tends to be relatively stiff. And so all that stuff gets reflected either downward or downward and forward or forward, depending on whatever strategy I'm using in the pelvis. And so, again, that's what the compressive stuff looks like. So that just gives you the, so I always use the toothpaste because it's easy to see, right? And so then my strategy, if I want to overcome this and I want to restore, you know, variability of movement, I need to push, teach myself to expand that stuff front to back. And now I can turn again, right? Does that give you a good representation then? So you can kind of see the squishiness. Cool. Any questions about that? Um, um, you, I think you've spoken previously about pushing the guts down into the pelvis to help ex like expand the pelvis. Sure. Uh, like circumferentially. Um, I assume that's a pretty important stabilizing force during gait. Like you need to be able to push the guts down into the inside of the pelvis to create stability during gait. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else are you going to use? So, so, so everything on the inside of you is underappreciated. 
like everybody looks at movement from the outside because that's what we see. But if you didn't have any air in your lungs and if you didn't have any organs inside of your, your abdomen, there would be nothing to squeeze and compress. And so then what you would do is you would eventually look like that. Or you would do that. You would just collapse because there's nothing to squeeze, right? If you were truly hollow and had no fluid, fluid volume, you would collapse. There's nothing to hold you up. So the best example that I could give you is the tube man outside of the car wash every day when I go to iFast, right? So there's that tube guy that has the fan in it and they blow him up and he stands up straight and then the fan turns off and he collapses back down and they blow him back up and he stands up straight. So, so we're the same way. We have air, and we have fluid, so they're both fluids actually, but we have air and we have guts. And so we have to be able to compress those to maintain the shape of our body. And so the way that we compress that determines what shape we actually are. And so training will influence that, rehab will influence that. And that's how we see changes in mobility, either in a good way or a bad way, depending on your perspective and what the needs are. Does, um, does ground contact squeeze the bottom of the tube of the toothpaste? Is ground contact. Like initial contact during gait? Mm -hmm. From like the ground reaction? Oh, the ground reaction? Coming, coming through the acetabulum, would that mm -hmm. actually like... So, so, so if there's forces going down and there's forces going back up, there, yeah, you're going to have a resultant at some point in time during in the system, right? Okay. Um, imagine an anti-gravity situation like being in space. You ever seen the astronauts in space, right? They look puffy because they don't have any ground reaction forces, right? Well, I, like, I guess what I mean is like if, this, <laughs> like if my femur comes into my acetabulum and it hits the ground and mm -hmm. it does that, mm -hmm. like if I can't push the guts Correct. to stabilize from the inside, it, it's just going to like, right, I, right. I so you're take the path of, you will always take the path of least resistance, right? And so the internal volume provides me the ability to create a force externally that allows me to control position. And so if I don't have those forces, so, so if the guts are going forward and I need them to go down, then I'm going to have a hinge. And there you go, right? Yeah. And then vice versa, if I want to hinge, guess what? Your guts are going to reflect forward. Right. I, work, I work with some like COPD patients. They look like a light bulb, like their, their pelvis yeah. is like this big. And then their rib cage is like a hot air balloon. Correct. And, yes. You know, like they yeah. can't push anything down just visually. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And now, now you're talking about magnifying effort for everything. So it's not like they're, they're not already living in anaerobesis, but every time you ask them to do something, the fatigue accumulates incredibly rapidly. Yeah, they, right. they grunt like crazy. Yeah, well, why are they grunting? Trying to push it down. Well, the, yeah, so they're trying to create internal pressure that they can't create anymore because they don't have the elasticity. You know, they can't, I mean, you spend most of your time with COPD patients pushing air out. Yeah. Because right? because if, if you just let them hyperinflate, they're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. yeah, that's tough. Those are, those are, I mean, those are, when, when you can make a change in those kind of people, one, they truly appreciate it, but you deserve a pat on the back because they are very, very difficult. Because they're, they're, the constraints have changed to such a degree that, that it's, it's, a, it's just a constant battle that does not get better. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? All right. I got one more question, I believe. Um, how has your assessment or intervention strategy hierarchy evolved and changed over the last several years since you started IFAS University? Wow, that's a small question, huh? Then we have a week. <laughs> um, it's all been simplified. 
I can I can say that that's been the goal though for a really long time is to simplify it to eliminate confusion and to create a coherent model. So that's what I teach now. So every semester I have a student. I believe that Corey Hecht, who is on this call, is on my list. I think is it 2021, dude? Is it? Yep, um, spring 2021. Okay. And uh, um, so so we have just worked over and over and over again to refine this model and to simplify it. Um, we can while we can use any number of of tests and evaluation that may be helpful a standardized version of what I do is about 12, 12 tests. Well, hi, Lance. Welcome. Hey. You're late. I know. Sorry. It's okay. But uh, no, we, we just, we've just narrowed it down and pared it down and pared it down. So I don't know if I've ever told this story on IFAST to you before, but um, when we initially opened IFAST, we did 77 different tests on everybody that walked in. Um, just because they're typically not a painful client or anything like that. They're athletes. We wanted to see, you know, what was important, what wasn't important. And then we slowly just weaned it down over time to about 12, 12 tests. Um, that being said, when you're dealing with the complexity of human movement, there's always stuff that you have to kind of throw in. So I'll give you, for instance, so I had a, a, a knee specific patient that came in today. And so we did three other tests just to make sure that we knew what we were looking at beforehand because the knee has some specific needs that don't necessarily show up in those that are driven more towards determining axial skeletal orientation position, um, pressure strategies and volumes. And so, so um, you know, we had to throw those in, but that's not a regular thing because we typically don't have to do that. Um, so again, everything is about simplification. Um, everything that, that we do from an intervention strategy is a lot like that. So all we're doing is shifting this stuff around, right? So we're, we're promoting shape change, we're changing volumes, we're changing pressures, so we can change the orientation of, of the movement system to allow movement to occur. Um, and so that would be it in a nutshell because Again, if we had a specific question, if you guys have something specific that you would like to ask, I would be happy to answer that. But um, again, the, that question is so wide open that we could spend a week on it. So if there's anything specific that you want to understand about an evaluation process, um, then we could talk about that if you like. Um, if there's an intervention strategy that you have a curiosity about, we can talk about that too. So I will open it up. I asked that question because I think the last time that I saw you in person was 2015 at uh, Kevin Neal's old facility. Oh my in, gosh! In Jersey, yeah, a long that, time. That ago. was like a life. Was that 2015? It seems. I think so. Yesterday. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, things are different. <laughs> um, say you have someone who is in a state of, I guess this would be like the standard human asymmetrical pattern, right? Where they're in a state of. I guess that would be low pressure on the right side of their thorax and then higher pressure on the left side of their thorax. It depends on which, which part you're talking about, but I'll, I'll go with it. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've been trying to get the DPT degree right now, so I've unfortunately had to veer most efforts towards <laughs> passing those exams instead of reading about pressure, I'm just, and, I'm just, which, which I'd like to. But, okay. Um, so can I make it really, really simple? Yeah. Have you, have you guys studied PNF yet? Yeah. Okay. Just use PNF. Okay. Because so, that, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Right? The, so, so, so think of your diagonal patterns. Mm -hmm. Really simple. And so you want to drive the diagonal pattern to create expansion where there is too much compression and to drive compression where there's too much expansion. Right? And then, so what is the fluid inside of your body that you can change? Uh, that would be like fluid inside your body that you can change mm -hmm. respiration yeah, yeah it's air so, so the <laughs> yeah. air is the thing you're gonna so 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 you're you're sort of stuck with the fluid volume in the abdomen but you can move it around but the the air is compressible and so we can we can actually use that quite a bit to our advantage and move that around and create expansion and, and such 
right? But all I got to do is drive a PNF pattern in the appropriate direction, and I can sort of open areas of that axial skeleton to create space for volume where I may not have it. So if an area that appears to be compressed, all I have to do is drive the, the appropriate muscle activity to create an expanded area and then that volume improves. And then I go from a concentric orientation to an eccentric orientation and guess what? You just restored movement capabilities in that area. Now, real quick, I think my dog is about to bark. So he just came in from outside. He tends to get very, very excited. And he's not. Oh, wow. She got a new trick. This is awesome. Okay, so he didn't bark. I saved the day. All right. Does that kind of answer your question, though, Colin, as far as from a strategy standpoint? Yeah. Um, do you think, like, when's the time when you wouldn't necessarily use a PNF pattern? Like, if you use, like, an ipsilateral reaching pattern to drive, like, compression on one side and expansion on another? Is that something that you just you use the PNF pattern, dude? All right. It's, it's still a PNF. It's still, you're, 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 you're doing one thing on one side and then the opposing side is doing the opposite, correct? Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, still, you're still driving PNF. Okay. It, may not, it may not look exactly the same. So, so let me give you, let me give you a, 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 an example of what I mean. Mm. So if you, did, if you did a one arm, so, so you got a dumbbell in your right hand and you're going to do a, a right dumbbell curl. Do you know what PNF pattern that would support? That'd be D1 flexion. It'd be well if you brought it to your face, it would. Yeah. Most people don't do that, right? Most people would 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 move it towards the shoulder, right? Towards the humerus. Right? Okay. Which would yep. be which would actually drive more of the uh, uh, D2 flexion. Okay. Right? Do, do you see what I'm getting at? It's like so you don't have yeah. to have this full gigantic fluid pattern. To, to actually represent it, right? And so everything that you do, everything that you do is rotation. And so everything has that built in. It's just like, how much rotation do you see? How much rotation do you wanna drive? And then like I said, you just have to identify, okay, where, where am I limiting motion by compression? And where do I need expansion and eccentric orientation to allow movement to occur? It's very, very simple. It's very simple that way. Okay. And so, and so going back to the original question, the evaluation process is to determine where those areas are. And then the intervention process is to change that. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it is a simplified viewpoint. Doesn't change the complexity of humans, unfortunately, but it does simplify your thought process and it allows you to be a very, very specific, very, very quickly and to make a much, much faster inter in, or much, much faster change in regards to the interventions that you're using. Okay. And then you take it to the gym because that's no different as far as the strategy is concerned in regards to, to reinforcing movement, right? Again, I get to choose whether I restrict movement or whether I try to increase movement. So you want to restrict movement, concentrically orient, exhale really hard to create internal pressure, and don't turn, and train symmetrically. Lance yeah, Goyke, do you have a question? That's the last question that you posted. That seems oddly convenient given what time it is. Oh, it is 8.30. I was, I was cooking. Uh, I, I like that. That was good. The uh, you I said D1 flexion too, Colin. I was wrong as well. <laughs> but I like to flare my elbows when I curl. Okay, so so there, would, there may be somebody that actually has to use that strategy, right? Sure. It just depends on, on what your movement capabilities are. I don't necessarily think I would want to reinforce that on a regular basis, depending on what the strategy is. Right? But I was using it as an example that, that, as you've heard me say on numerous occasions, Lance, it's the, the answer to every question falls into five possibilities. And one of them is it's PNF. And, uh, and more so, often than not. <laughs> correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Cabot Knott and Voss kind of had it figured out a long time ago. <laughs> so I'm a big fan. That sounds like PNF in practice for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what a great title for a book. On the spot, I'm trying to think of a question for you. I I just I really resonated with the idea that the D2 and you know breaking down this gym movement mm -hmm. into something that you can use intelligently, you know. Right. Right. And your well, point and, and about again, using a, it. One of the big problems that people run into is is exercise selection. You know, when do I use this exercise? When do you use that exercise? And then what it, what, it, what it comes down to is that people try to categorize all these movements into, into what is it? Uh, I don't even know what they are anymore. Uh, squat, hinge, push, pull, something, 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 right? When, if you're trying to reinforce movement capabilities, it's just turn. <laughs> Which way do I need to turn stuff? Um, and, and that's ultimately what it is. So it becomes PNF. So you're, so when, when you show me a push, I'm seeing the rotations. I, I see the PNF patterns, right? I don't see a push. That's, that's, a, that's a superficial generalized representation. That's a visual representation of something, or it's a name that we gave it to simplify and have a conversation. But the reality is when it comes to the movement concerns, it is a turn. If both sides of the body are turning in the same direction at the same time, the resultant will be a straight plane movement. So I'm either pulling or pushing. Well, those are both rotations that are occurring towards each other or away from each other, depending on your perspective. Right? So it's all, yep. turn. it's all turning. It's just all turning. Is that the, the new bill quote that I need to spread around? It's, it's, <laughs> it's just turning. It's, it's funny when, when I'll say something to someone and then it starts to show up. It's weird. It's weird. <laughs> the world got very small for some reason. I'm not really sure why. We're, uh, we're in a, a very niche corner of a large industry, maybe. I think. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Corey, always... what was your... Uh, actually, uh, before I talk to Corey, Sean, hi. I don't know if we've ever talked face to face. Well, messages what was your uh what was your favorite part of this night just a general open discussion uh, first time i've spoken face to face with bill um met once again messaging plenty of times with some great responses and some of bill's great terms like smoosh um, <laughs> it's a technical term yep <laughs> see this is this is smoosh and this would be a squish just for the record okay so the thing between the two so smoosh is more anterior posterior. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. You get smushed that way, but you squish them the other way. Right. Because if you're too smooshed, you got to squish them. Right. <laughs> is smush with a U? I, I think it's. I think technically, it's it's a uh, it's derivative of a uh, of an old Greek term. And I, I believe it. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> how long you could take that. I was actually going to go German and just say that it's S M O with the umlaut and then the S C H or something at the end, but that would probably be a little bit too much. <laughs> Eric, I thought your shirt was off for a second. I'm not sexy. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> anything real quick? Anything that anything that just pops into your head that, real quick off any topic? Um, short of, uh, um, you know, bodily hygiene or something like that. I don't really want to talk about that. When do you see someone who just, you just don't do any of the stuff that you normally do? What does that person look like? I don't know what you mean by that. Like, what stuff do I not do, Lance? When, well, I guess I don't know what you do anymore, but... When I have people come in and I look at them, they usually look like their right shoulder is lower and their right hip is higher and mm -hmm. they're always turning and facing the right. Mm -hmm. um, and Does that bother we, you? 
No, that is totally fine. It's when they don't look like that or they don't respond to the stuff that they normally respond to. Okay. That's confusing. Okay. So, so what do you, what, what could you do? So you're not a lay them on the table kind of a guy, right? You're, not really. You're, you're like a go train guy, right? Yeah. And so, so how do I identify potential needs if, if I don't, measure things in isolation because frankly i've got people that i don't even measure in isolation anymore um even in the purple room okay um sometimes you just ask people to move and do certain stuff so i'll give you for instance so i got a tennis player he's really tall and he comes in and he says you know i play for like 20 30 minutes and then my hip starts to hurt and so i say well does it hurt right now and she goes, well, of course not. I haven't played for 20 or 30 minutes. And then so what I do is I make him do a bunch of stuff. So we'll do a bunch of lunges in all different directions. And then we'll do like, you know, rotation with a lunge or a squat and a reach. And, and we'll just do a bunch of reps. So we'll take him over on the turf side and we'll do a, sort of like a, a sprinter's warm up. Right, a, a skips, a marches, running progressions, step ups, just a lot of different movement. Um, one, to potentially induce fatigue because chances are if he has pain 20 to 30 minutes into a match, there's probably an element of capacity that needs to be addressed that may be an influence. And so for me to get a, the look at someone that might be appropriate, I need to see what he does when he gets tired. And so that might be a way to do that. Now, the question mark is, when somebody moves in a complex movement, do you understand the relationships that are possible within those, those segments that are moving, right? So if somebody reaches up overhead, if they're doing a one-arm press overhead with a kettlebell, what direction does the neck tend to turn when they press overhead with their right arm? Do you like know? That. Well, Okay, so, so that might be something that you want. I don't know why you would, but that might be something that you want or you're gonna see something else that in, in that relationship that might influence your decision-making in regards to what their needs may actually be if, if your intention is to make that change. So again, you just have to decide that. So again, understanding those relationships, right? We don't have to throw people on tables and measure them to determine what their needs might be. We, but we do need to understand what movements are possible when I constrain something else. So when the hip is flexed, I see what you mean. When the hip is flexed, the movement potential changes than when the hip is extended. You don't move the same. Yeah. Even the musculature that surrounds the, the hip and pelvis doesn't behave the same. You know, one of my pet peeves is calling certain muscles um, in, in, in the, uh, the pelvis and, and hip external rotators because they change direction when you move the hip. So why would they call them that? Because they're looking at a dead guy laying on a slab. They yanked on the muscle and go, oh, look, the hip does this. Well, let's call it that. And now everybody thinks that that's what that muscle does because it's called that. Right? When the reality is that if I bend the hip, it doesn't do that anymore. And so now it's misnamed. But then you create confusion. Right? And then so people don't really understand right, what, they're, what they're looking at. So it makes it difficult. Dynamic anatomy is a little bit different than dead guy anatomy. Right? So when you're looking at someone move, do you understand those relationships? And if you don't, then that would be your area of focus for understanding to get better at what you do. So, so understand, can I try to paraphrase? Um, good luck with that, but it was a bit yeah. rambly. It was a bit rambly. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> um, so I can, I can test in, whatever position is seemingly relevant to me as a coach to this individual in front of me, yep. 
but I need to understand where they might compensate and maybe even have a guess of where I think they're, they will compensate or not compensate. Right. And maybe I'd have to define what not compensating really means. But. Right. And, and so, so some people have evolved or built in compensatory strategies that you may not understand or you may not be able to pick up. And so you have to take that into consideration as well. So now you're erring on the side of caution, of course, but, but again, you have to take that into consideration, right? Not all movement is necessarily achieved in an ideal manner. I, I've just seen so many people who, you know, you just leave them to their own devices for a split second and they just go back to what they know. They well, push yeah, everything forward, crunch down, whatever it is, shrug yeah. up. Right. But, and and then I if just, you, but if you can give them an activity that um, doesn't require you to say anything and then allow you to achieve the outcome that you wanted, then they're immediately successful. And then now you didn't create confusion in their brain. They just reacted to what you, what you gave them to do. And then again, then you get your goal and they get their goal. But again, that's, that's part of being an, being experienced enough and having failed enough times, right? So, so that you do understand. I've, I've found over the years that I have always erred on the side of under training people to ensure that it is good when that's not what they're looking for necessarily, um, you know, depending on their, their path that they've come through. And I've found myself just saying, no, you're doing it wrong <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and that's okay. I mean, yeah. That's okay. It's, it, we, we had talked about this before you came on is that we all have this model that we work from and then we have to get, we get to decide, you know, how close to that model do they need to be where I would consider that a successful attempt or a useful attempt to teach them something. If they, if they need to learn how to, how to perform an activity, you know, so you get to decide that and you, but you, but you need to have a frame of reference. You can't just, you know, I don't think you need to jump on people and say, Oh, that's absolutely wrong. Because again, give them time to figure things out. And that's hard too. Sometimes, like I said, we tend to overcoach. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Me as well as anybody. Yeah. Well, like I said, I think we all do. I think we all yeah. do. Cause we want to we want to make sure everybody knows how smart we are. You know, and a lot of times just shut up. Yeah, and just let them figure it out. Right. It's hard. It is hard. It is hard. That's why you you know you got the button up collared shirt, right? You know, I got my coaching stance, right? and so I got to be purposeful because if I just stand there and not say anything, then people don't think I'm very useful. But even though that might be the perfect thing to do under the circumstances. And so I'm old now. And so I get to do that. But when you're a 21 year old intern, you got to tell everybody how smart you are. And so they coach too much. Right? I, you took those words out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, most of the coaches around me are pretty young, but I, I do the same thing. I'm just so quiet and, you know, not all the time, but most of the time and mm -hmm. just wait until I need to inter interject. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I find that the, the, the guys that say so little tend to be some of the better coaches because when they do speak and what they do say is so impactful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Derek Hansen pops into my head. He's, he's such a cool yeah. human being and, and watching him coach live was, was, was cool to see, but he, he's, he just stands there and the guy does something and he just goes, do it again. And just stands there and waits. And the guy does it again. He goes, okay, one more. And then he goes, okay, now just put your elbow right there. And the guy does that and he goes, Oh, that's perfect. And then you see the difference. You know, it's just, it's just brilliant. I just love yeah. it. I love yeah. it. He's so concise. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we all want to try to be someday when we grow up. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks that for was good. Coming. Yeah, no, it was fun. It was fun.